you know, uh, just having a good understanding of uh, grounding techniques uh, and other ways to avoid EMI and crosstalk. I think that's always an important topic. Uh, so we've taken a different approach to it over the different webinars. This is one slice of that information. Uh, we're gonna have our design team join as well uh, to answer any questions you may have. So if you have detailed questions, please ask them uh, so that we can address them either in this webinar or in future webinars and or content. Uh, we really uh, have a mission to help all designers in the world uh, with their designs and get to get to a, a manufacturing ready design and a design that works best as quickly as possible through our content and our software tools. Um, so actually, before we get started, one other comment, uh, stay, you know, stay tuned for on our website, we're going to be launching a uh, discussion forum so that all these important and complex topics can be discussed um, while I'm sleeping uh, and people in the community can share with each other. I think all that's really important. So it furthers the cause. So stay tuned for that. Lucy will have more information about that. Okay, so the basics. So crosstalk is an unintended coupling between the adjacent circuits of your board. And here the aggressor signal overpowers the victim signal, even if they're not connected. So this coupling primarily occurs through capacitive and inductive coupling. So crosstalk occurs in your design when, when two traces run closely parallel to each other on the same layer and uh, ground planes are placed distant from the signal planes. And if there are any split planes or splits in your grounds. So be careful of all those things. And yesterday I saw a design that we built um, two mil trace in space, all parallel lines. And while the technology of manufacturing is impressive to have parallel traces uh, manufactured like that with traditional PCB process, I don't think it was a good design. I think everyone can learn from these type of things. Sorry. All right. So near end and far end crosstalk. So near end crosstalk or next and far end crosstalk or fext are categorized based on the location where the crosstalk is detected. Next is the noise that is picked up by the victim trace near the driver end. And once next is induced, the victim signal will start traveling in the opposite direction as the aggressor signal. And a victim trace experiences fext when the electromagnetic field generated by an aggressor signal induces noise near the receiver end. The induced FEXT pulse interacts with the lump inductance of the victim interact, interconnect and leads to ringing. So, we're going to do a tool demo, I think, at this point on calculating next and facts using our impedance tools. And then once 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 that's done, we'll come back with you know all of these topics. Um, you know, just as a side, if you haven't seen our tools or used our tools, I highly recommend them. They're pretty fantastic. And they're very powerful to help designers achieve what they're trying to achieve. And and they're free, 
and it's us giving back to the community. And uh, I would highly recommend taking advantage of those tools. And they're for you. So, you know, on the forum, when we launch it, you can also give us fee asynchronous feedback on how to make the tools better. So we're always trying to trying to do that. Okay, hand it off to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Sierra C Circuits Impedance Calculator uh, uses the 2D numerical solution of Maxwell's equations for PCB transmission lines and renders fairly accurate results suitable for use in circuit board manufacturing and engineering analysis. Uh, this impedance calculator uh, is integrated with signal loss and crosstalk calculators. Uh, our impedance calculator has 82 impedance models with multiple geometries, such as the coated microstrip, the uncoated microstrip, embedded microstrip, and the strip line. Um, and each of these geometries can be chosen as a single-ended, a differential pair, or a coplanar. Uh, so let us take an example of a coated microstrip in a differential pair. Uh, you can see that the coated microstrip differential pair is uh, displayed here. The tools are displayed in a normal and a composite model. Uh, I have opened the calculator here and entered the values here, in input values, just to save some time. So you can see that the geometry that has been selected is displayed here. You can use this drop down to change the units of your desired choice. And uh, you can fill in the dialectic information here. Uh, for trace information, we put in the delta W, uh, the trace thickness, and you can either put the trace separation or the sum of the trace uh, width and the separation. For example, let us take 12 mils here and a target differential impedance of maybe 100 ohms. Uh, for the trace width, click on calculate W. So you can see that along with the trace width, there are other parameters that will be calculated here, such as the uh, coupling coefficient, the odd even mode impedances, the propagation delays, uh, et cetera. Uh, this tool is also, along with the signal loss and the S parameter calculators, it is integrated with the crosstalk calculator here. Uh, for crosstalk calculator, uh, the near end crosstalk uh, is highly dependent on the uh, separation between the traces, and the far end crosstalk depends predominantly on the trace length uh, and the rise time. Uh, so let us take a value here. For example, let us take two as a trace length and a signal rise time of 200 picoseconds and maybe a signal voltage of two volts and click on uh, calculate crosstalk. Uh, so the near end crosstalk results and the far end crosstalk results are displayed here. Uh, if suppose I increase this uh, trace length into three inches uh, and click on calculate crosstalk, uh, the far end crosstalk also increases. Uh, also, if suppose I decrease this signal rise time to maybe 100 picoseconds uh, and calculate the crosstalk, uh, we can see that the noise voltage here has increased. Uh, so we can conclude uh, that the faster transition, if the fa transition is faster, then the voltage is higher and therefore the fast, uh, far end crosstalk uh, is higher. Uh, for a slower transition, it has a lesser impact. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Let me share my screen again. So what strikes you first uh, when it comes to mitigating EMI and crosstalk in your PCB design? Uh, if you can interact with us, that'd be great. Some of these things are your placement of your layers, routing strategically your sensitive traces, grounding techniques, component placement strategies, and EMI shielding techniques.
there's no correct answer, but honestly, they're all important. And so we're going to talk about them all. If there's one more important to you than the other that you'd like to know about or learn about, please, please ask or chat. So near and dear to any manufacturer's heart is the stack up, but sometimes the stack up is when the fat and fabricator looks at it is really only from a manufacturability point of view and not from a signal integrity point of view or any other type of electrical performance uh, point of view, uh, which is wrong. Uh, it should be a combination of everything. So Sierra has created a stack of tool. You'll get a demo of that, which incorporates more things um, into it. But, uh, you know, one common thing is to have the ground planes, uh, one dielectric away from the signal and the power planes, uh, at least. Uh, I would say keep your power planes sandwiched between ground planes. Uh, this helps you distribute the power planes evenly across the stack up as well. Uh, and then, you know, for a four layer board, um, here's one option of this. And for an eight layer board as well, here's another option for your layer orders. Are we jumping right into the demo? Yeah, I think we should. So, you know, one selling point is that I can't tell you how many times we look at stack ups that have not been vetted yet and they're highly costly or just not manufacturable at all. And literally that's what the reason the stack up tool was created. The secondary reason is if you use these stack ups, you'll get a more accurate product because we've run all sorts of characterizations on these stack ups. Um, so you can be confident in their manufacturability and their performance electrically. So I'm going to hand it off again uh, for a stack up demo. I think if you haven't used it again, it's super important in the early parts of your design process. So I think I'm handing it off. Let me stop my share. Hi again. Our PCB stack up designer tool uh, provides manufacturable and cost optimized stack ups and also includes an impedance calculator. Uh, the total allows the tool allows you to change the signal plane combination and the copper weights in the generated stack up. Uh, first, you need to enter the board information. For example, let us name the PCB project as demo, a revision number, the length and breadth of the PCB. Uh, for the target thickness, um, use a drop down for different thicknesses to select from. Uh, for the material, here you can uh, use this drop down to choose one of these materials, or you can click on the material selector compare guide. Uh, to view the data sheets of these materials and uh, you know compare the various attributes. Uh, once you're done with the board information, you can uh, you need to choose one of the listed design approaches in the stack up design section. Uh, you can choose the first option here if you know the number of layers required in your design, or if you have a complex BGA that dictates the number of signal plane layers uh, in your board, then you can choose the second option. Uh, let us go with the first option for now. You uh, can enter a, a layer count here. Let us take, take eight, for example, and a four signal, four plane, uh, signal plane layer combination. Click on Run Stack Up Design now. Uh, here you will be presented with the Sierra Circuits recommended stack ups. Uh, this table gives the stack up information uh, like the signal plane layers standard HDI stack up, sequential lamination, the PCB thickness, and the technology level and cost index. Uh, 
you can use this help content for a brief description of the parameter, corresponding parameter. Uh, click on report to view the uh, stack up that is uh, that resembles your final stack up. So in this report page here, uh, you can view the attributes without going back to the previous page. If you do any changes to this PCB here, click on generate custom stack up uh, to update. On uh, scrolling further down, you can view the stack up in detail. It provides information on the material, layer type, copper percentage, finished thickness in mills, dielectric or copper waste thickness, copper plating thickness, the dielectric description, dielectric constant, and the material construction details. Uh, you can also change the layer type here. For example, in layer three, I'll change it to mixed. And we can see that the copper percentage is automatically adjusted. I will also change the layer six to mixed for a symmetrical stack up here. Uh, maintaining a symmetry in the stack up uh, usually minimizes the differential signal skew, which can lead to uh, EMI. You know, you can you can also click on this uh, cross mark to remove the solder mask. Uh, layer there and you can scroll further down and uh, here we see the sierra circuits built-in impedance calculator here uh, this will allow you to add control impedance and compute the trace width and trace spacing for the target uh, impedance to add the impedance click on this plus button uh, this adds a fresh line here to the impedance table you can select a signal layer for example three add in a target impedance let us take 100 ohms. Uh, we'll take a differential pair. Select a reference. The first reference layer is 2, maybe. And then second reference layer is 4. So the transmission line model that comes here is strip line differential pair. Click on Calculate. Uh, so the trace width, the impedance, and the propagation delay is calculated over here and displayed. Uh, you can also click on this view to see the other additional parameters that has been calculated by impedance calculators, if you wish to do so. Uh, now you can uh, save the stack up by clicking on this save button here uh, and download it in the IPC standard uh, 2581. Uh, clicking on save generates an ID that allows you to access the stack up in their next login sessions. If you click on this export to IPC 2581, uh, the stack up data is imported in a .xml file, which can be implemented to any ECAT tool, which supports IPC 2581. Uh, off to the slides, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we uh, did a great job uh incorporating ipc 2581 i think that's fantastic if you guys as designers are not using that i encourage you to do that um not every fabricator can take ipc 2581 but at the very least you can get us a, a kickstart off of the stack up uh, from our website i'll put it in 2581 import it into your tool um, so I hope you see the value in that. And if you have any questions, definitely, you know, let us know. Uh, it should change, it should change how you request stackups instead of sending an email off to a fabricator. You should be using this tool, get what you need quickly. Um, is a great, uh, starting point. And we're going to be building out our library even more and more. So if you have any requests for material types or types of constructions or anything like that, let us know. We would uh, incorporate that. So in terms of routing, uh, you know, there is a technique of providing at least a 3W separation between the traces to reduce the risks of coupling. Uh, so that's an important technique. Sometimes you don't always have the space to do that, but uh, I think that's really important. Place adjacent signal layers orthogonally uh, to minimize capacitive coupling. I think most people know that rule. 
uh, route your critical signals such as RF tracks on the external layers. This minimizes the needs for vias and critical signals can smoothly sound countering via stubs. This also reduces the risk of signal reflections. Avoid right angles and adopt a 45 degree. This maintains uniform trace geometry, reducing the risk of impedance discontinuity and signal degradations. And the edge of the boards are susceptible to mechanical stress and handling defects. Therefore, avoid placing critical lines, such as power traces near the edge of the board, right at least 50 mils of space in between these traces and the board edges. Yeah, you don't need 50 mils, but definitely it's a good, it's a good advice. There's also the concept of guard traces, and they can effectively isolate the clock trace from, let's say, adjacent signal traces. They can help protect the signal line from unwanted electromagnetic coupling and suppress uh, any sort of uh, radiated electromagnetic emissions from the clock circuit. So guard, guard traces typically connect to the ground plane or some sort of dedicated reference voltage. And, and they are spaced 3W to 5W from the critical signal trace as a practice. So decoupling capacitors uh, near power supply help prevent crosstalks. So the decoupling capacitor provides a low impedance return path uh, for high frequency noise current and prevent it from interfering with the power supply circuits. And to reduce EMI effectively, use the decoupling capacitors with high frequency rating and a low ESR. Arrange multiple decoupling capacitors in parallel with each other and position the lowest value capacitor closest to the power supply for rapid attenuation of high frequency noise components. For instance, if there's three capacitors of such values, place, um, place their appropriate near the power supply. So termination resistors also uh, can help prevent signal degradation. So proper series termination control signals, edge rates, and prevents signal overshoot and undershoot that can lead to EMI. And the resistor value should be one-tenth of the line impedance value. And opt for shunt or parallel termination resistors to deal with impedance discontinuities and signal reflections. Uh, place the shunt termination resistor as close as possible to the line and to reduce the stub length. And so LC uh, filters from a resonant circuit to block high frequency noise components interfering with the rest of the circuit. To eliminate common mode noise effectively, place a parallel LC filter near the entry point of the signal lines. To minimize differential mode noise, add a series LC filter in the signal path. Position inductors and capacitors closely to the filter to minimize the loop area and keep high speed signal traces away from the LC filter components to avoid coupling. You can also use uh, ferret beads to help reduce EMI. Um, they work on the principle of inductive coupling. I wouldn't be over dependent on ferret beads. You need to apply all the concepts discussed uh, to your board design for best results. So common mode choke uh, is also a good technique. So common mode choke is an electromagnetic component that blocks high frequency noise and pass direct and alternating currents through a circuit. It consists of two wires wound around a ferret core. The choke operates through two primary mechanisms. First, it directs the noise currents in the same direction, then it generates a magnetic field. This generates a magnetic field. And these mechanisms enhance the magnetic flux and effectively suppress common mode current flow. 
So next, keep high-speed components such as os oscillators, crystals, and switching regulators away from sensitive parts like amplifier sensors, analog to digital converters. Separate the analog and digital circuits to minimize coupling and place components as close as possible to their respective power and ground planes to reduce parasitic effects. So next is uh, via impedance to manage EMI. So at high frequencies, vias uh, behave like uh, breakpoints through the transmission line. This disrupts the impedance continuity, leading to signal reflections. So to avoid impedance discontinuity through vias, ensure that the vias, the via impedance is equivalent to the trace impedance. Um, also minimize the via stub length as much as possible. Um, implement a coaxial via structure to minimize the return loop. Here, the via carrying the signal is placed at the center and surrounded by multiple ground vias to provide a low impedance path for return currents. And of course, you can try Sears Circuit's uh, via impedance calculator to render accurate via capacitance, inductance, and impedance using its physical dimensions. If you can uh, chat and interact with us, so you know what what are the layout techniques that you use the most out of what we've talked about. So there's shielding methods to block the EM radiation. You can use the You know, this type of EMI shielding. Use your Faraday cage. So you do need continuous copper. Uh, around the designated areas, and you should follow the DRC rules required for that. And which do you use the most? So four best grounding practices we're going to discuss. So keep the return paths and loop areas as small as possible. Split, never split the ground plane. So be careful of split planes. Isolate analog digital power supply, low speed and high speed signals. Cover all unused areas of the circuit with copper pores and connect them to the ground plane. The via stitching is also an important aspect. Uh, so it is what it looks like. Um, so provide via to via spacing at least one tenth of the targeted signal wavelength as a guideline. Make sure your manufacturer can properly handle the size of vias that you're using. So which is the most effective grounding method to manage EMI and crosstalk? Uh, do we have another demo lined up? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so we'll see uh, what are the various rules and uh, techniques uh, which are used in designing high-speed uh, PCBs for mitigating the various noises, especially the EMI noises. So uh, we have a design here, uh, which consists of a SMA connector, which is getting in a line of 50 ohm stays, which is uh, which has a trace width of 7.6 min, which is calculated based on the stack-up design. 
and this phase with uh, this phase is then passing through a series of uh, components uh, which are basically uh, used for filtering purposes for example the chokes uh, then there are lc filters ferrite bits uh, transformers and then attenuators isolation transformers amplifiers so as you can see the trace is passing through a lot of uh, uh, inductive components it is quite obvious that we expect a lot of uh, noise especially the emi noise surrounding this uh, region and also if suppose there are uh, circuits present uh, surrounding on or in the vicinity of this circuit it can uh, be affected with the emi noise so the first technique that is used to suppress the emi noise is to use a physical shield so you can see this uh, this pairs over here this is actually a rectangular structure and each pad is basically a solder pad which is connected to ground. So on this pad, a physical external shield will be soldered, which will be helpful, which will help in mitigating the noise to the ground. So this, all the components will be soldered first. And then on top of that, the shield will be soldered. So this will <coughs> capture any noise, especially MI noises and ground it okay, immediately. So it will not allow any external noise to enter or any, any internal noise to uh, in, uh, interfere with the external circuits. So now suppose your board doesn't have enough uh, space or there is some spacing constraint where you can you cannot use a physical shield. So in that case, we can create a similar kind of a shield which is called as a Faraday's cage. So this is formed with the help of wires. So it forms a kind of a closed loop, either a square or a rectangle. Uh, and the spacing between the adjacent wires is decided by the maximum frequency content of the PCB. So that is normally uh, lambda by 10 or lambda by 8 spacing. That is the maximum spacing. Minimum, you can keep it as per your requirement. So that will be your uh, Faraday's cage. So which will help you in, again, will help you in reducing the EMI. So and wires will be basically the ground wires. Next thing uh, we always talk about is the uh, ground isolation or ground separation. So now in this case, we have used something, uh, 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 as you can see over here, there is a component, which is an isolation transformer. And you see this white strip in between them. So this is basically uh, a transform which is isolating the primary and the secondary ground, so which is very helpful he over here because the grounds on the primary and secondary are completely isolated, electrically isolated from each other and yeah, basically connected magnetically. So this helps in keeping two different grounds. But suppose you have a, a circuit which consists of analog and uh, digital ground. So in that case, you'll have to plan it accordingly uh, to se separate out the analog and the digital ground so that they don't overlap with each other anywhere such that the uh, noise can interfere with the two grounds. So uh, take care about that. So next thing uh, as we talk about is the 3W spacing. So as you can see on this left hand side over here, uh, the trace is surrounded by the copper plane, which is a ground copper plane and it has some spacings. This spacing is basically decided by 3W spacing. So as we said, uh, there are certain rules. If you go to design and rules, we have this rule created for clearance for 3W 50 ohms. So we have created a class of 50 ohm traces, which is named as 50 SE. And there are various rules which we have to set. So here, uh, the important rule is track to track and track to copper, uh, because that, those are the two important things which have to be followed. Uh, rest of the uh, rules can be uh, reduced a bit if required. So up to 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, our trace width is 7.6 minutes. So 7.6 7 into 3, that gives us 22.8 minutes. So that gives us the 3W spacing, which is set as 22.8 over here, track and copper as 22.8. Then we have set a rule for width, again, 50 ohms trace width, and the setting is 7.6 minutes for on, actually it is on the top and the uh, bottom layer only, but we have set it on all, uh, on all the layers. And all the minimum, maximum, as well as the preferred, all, all of them will be same. And we can even define the power wires as per the requirement. So in this case, we are just using one wire that is for powers. So uh, the maximum is 22 minutes and preferred is 20 minutes. That is the pad, pad size and preferred uh, whole diameter will be 10 minutes. Maximum is 12 minutes. So now suppose I change this copper thickness instead of 22.8, just for visualization, we can change it to 50 minutes and say, okay, and if I report this, uh, you'll notice that the spacing which is there will increase quite drastically. So that is a rule which is set for the uh, 3W spacing. So if we change it to 50 minutes, so it increase, increase quite, quite a lot. So uh, we'll get back to this 
normal so 3w is the minimum spacing which you have to follow if you if you want to follow more than that then it is absolutely fine otherwise uh, if you if it is less than 3w it can affect the coplanar uh, it can result in a coplanar impedance uh, uh, structure and will change the impedance of your line okay so the next thing uh, is guard traces so we have shown a, a few traces over here to just uh, show what are the guard traces so as you can see each trace is separated by a plane so which is basically the ground plane so when uh, the uh, each traces or adjacent traces are separated by ground planes those traces are called as uh, guard traces so right now it is possible to do it over here for uh, representation purpose but uh, might not always be possible in your design so a uh, few things that has to be taken uh, uh, kept in mind that even if you are using guard traces the minimum clearance from your trace from your trace to the uh, plane should be 3w again okay which is showing over here this 23 minutes so approximately 22.8 minutes so that has to be always taken care even if you are using it as a card band and uh, if suppose guard band is not possible then you will have to route the traces parallel to each other right adjacent to each other in in that case also the minimum spacing which has to be followed is 3w so that has to be taken care uh, all the time then uh, we have something uh, you must have seen rf traces are normally accompanied by uh, the power planes or that is the ground planes on the either side and along with the ground planes there are ground wires which are accompanying over the length of the uh, trace that is called as the trace shielding so in that case uh, that also we can follow so ltm has a uh, feature if you select the trace and if you go to tools and go to wire stitching and shielding and say add shielding to net now here there are various options first first of all uh, the net which we are selecting is ground nia this is the uh, name of the net which uh, to which we want to put the wires we have selected the wire style as top middle bottom and then hole size is uh, given as 10 mils tolerance is plus to minus uh, plus to mils and minus to mils and, and the uh, pad uh, pad size is 20 mils pad then we have this uh, grid spacing. So we have kept the spacing between adjacent uh, wires as 20 minutes and say, yeah, so suppose 30 minutes from the, so uh, make sure that this is following the 3W. It's better you keep it more than 3W. So 3W is 22.8, so I'll, I'm keeping it 30, 30 right now. And row spacing is not required because we are using only one row right now. This two uh, is not required right now, but you can try it out. We'll, uh, after selecting this, we'll say, okay. And you can see the wires will be automatically added around the trace uh, along the length of the entire uh, trace. So this is one of the uh, useful present in the uh, uh, Apart from this, we have something called as ground shielding. Uh, sorry, uh, wire stitching. Okay. Uh, so wire stitching depends upon uh, where you are adding. Suppose you are adding on the board edges, uh, then normally the, it is recommended to keep the spacing between wires quite larger compared to when you add the wire stitching around the a particular uh, section on the PCB, for example, a uh, um, high frequency um, or uh, power section uh, where, where there is a lot of switching noise uh, happening. So in those cases, the spacing is much smaller compared to uh, when you add the wire stitching in the open space or on the board edge especially. Normally, we recommend a, a wire spacing of 150 mils to 200 mils uh, when you add it on the open space or on the board edges. So that, let us add the uh, wire stitching, uh, stitching wire, okay. Uh, Select the plane, or you can and go to tools, wire stitching and shielding again, and go to add stitching to net. Again, uh, you have to select the wire style, which is again we are keeping it same. Ten mils uh, tolerance is plus or minus two mils, and the pad size is twenty mils. Uh, we are selecting the net again, ground NIA, and uh, we have to select whether we want it in the staggered manner or not. So I would recommend go with staggered manner. And grid for now, we'll keep it as 10, 100 mils. Okay, over here. Uh, grid is nothing but the spacing between the adjacent wires. And there are some uh, more rules related to the uh, net clearances with respect to the uh, clearance rule settings, which you can try it out over here, but we'll not use it for now. So after selecting this, just say, okay. So you see all the wires are automatically added uh, to the entire 
uh, ground plane. So this uh, ground plane uh, adding wire, stitching wires to ground plane is helpful in reducing the overall impedance of the ground plane. This helps in uh, reducing the return paths of any high frequency noise. Okay, uh, and also it will mitigate or uh, bypass any noise present around uh, a particular circuitry to the ground as uh, uh, as fast as possible. So uh, that's why the ground stitching is very important in order to reduce the ground plane uh, impedance of the ground plane. Yeah. Thank you. These are a few uh, techniques uh, that needs to be followed by designing your high frequency ports. So hope this will be useful for you in your future design. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so you can you can take over. Uh, thanks for that demo. Um, I, I, th I also wanted to welcome Uther here. Thank and you. And have him address some of the questions that we have. Uh, Uther, there was a question um, by Patrick adding decoupling. Uh, you can hear me out there, right? Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay, adding decoupling capacitors of varying capacitance values creates resonant peaks. Is it not better to use several capacitors of the same value in parallel if higher capacitance is required? I think that is a very correct observation. Uh, if you if you have two dissimilar value capacitors and dissimilar what you call their each resonant frequencies, then definitely there will be a peak generated between the two resonant frequencies. And if it increases the impedance at that point, and it generally does, then it is not a very good idea. So definitely one has to be careful how to avoid the undesirable peak. Okay, if that falls into a frequency area, which you are already taking care of by some other means to lower the impedance, then you can, uh, you, you can have the two dissimilar values. But primarily what happens is that you know, electrolytic capacitors, tantalum capacitors, you know, that's low, who have very low resonant frequencies, they fall in the low frequency domain for reducing the what we call as the impedance of the power design network of the PDN. That the ceramic capacitors are for the mid frequency and high frequencies. Thank you. Thank you, Atar. Uh, we have another question, which is uh, for the series termination to be one tenth of the line impedance. Can you further explain how would we how would you calculate it? Uh, can you repeat that? I did not get. For the series termination to be one tenth of the line impedance, can you further explain? how you would calculate it? Series terminations. Are we talking of some introducing some series resistance either at the source or the destination and of, uh, you know, to reduce the ringing and all that? If that is the issue, normally it is put at the source end and the one-tenth of the, uh, what do you call characteristic impedance of the transmission lines. I'm not very familiar because even for 50 ohm transmission lines, you know, a, 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 the series termination is primarily not one-tenth. I don't know where that number has come from. Uh, 
but primarily to reduce the reflections due to impedance mismatch at the source and destination. Let us take, we have a 50 ohm transmission line. At the source, the output impedance of the source is only 25 ohms. So what happens is, if a reflected signal comes back at the source, it will definitely get reflected because there is a trans impedance discontinuity of 25 to 50. In order to compensate for that, what we generally do is put a 25 ohm, or generally it is done 22 or 27 ohms because those are the two standard values in the series at the at the source end. Now many of the similarly, the same story happens at the termination, at, at the destination. At the destination end, normally, the input impedance of the receiver is normally very high. And basically, if you don't want any reflections there at all, you don't have a series termination. What you have is a termination from there of 50 ohms to the ground. So that is how it happens. So this 110th rule, I am not aware of. What is now many of the, you know, the ICs that we have nowadays, especially the large scale ICs, ASICs, etc. Many of them have the, even the, you know, this uh, series resistances that I'm talking of incorporated in their inside IC itself. So that basically the output impedance of the driver is always 50 ohms or whatever is the impedance of the particular protocol that is being followed over there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have one more question. Uh, Frederick is asking how important is trace gap for cross torque mitigation? Is smaller better? Can you repeat that again, Lucy? How important is trace gap for cross torque mitigation? Oh, it is important. It's definitely important. And the larger it is, the better it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think uh, the cross talk rough calculations can be done very easily through a cross talk calculator. I think we have one tool also on our website, okay? The impedance calculator actually also has it inside it, a crosstalk calculator. But roughly the rule should be, I mean, there are some rules of thumb for that. I think, uh, I mean, if you don't want to adjacent, see it is, the rule has to be like this. Let me put it this way. The longer the parallel uh, run of two adjacent traces, both carrying signals, okay? The longer the parallel run, the more important it is to reduce the crosstalk because the overall crosstalk would definitely be proportional in general to the length of the line. So if there is only a small parallel run, Maybe if the layout design constraints, et cetera, over there, you know, do not allow it, you know, the distance to increase uh, too much, use whatever the maximum you can use. But whenever there are significant parallel runs, there you need to keep them far away and take assistance. But at the same time, let me also say, if your ground plane, I mean, if the, your signal lines are very well shielded as, uh, you know, was being conveyed that actually for the high frequency signals and all that, we should have a shielding both by the, the ground plane down below and a ground, a plane above and a plane below then in that case, definitely the crosstalk gets considerably reduced. 
And if you keep, let us say, the distance of about twice the, uh, you know, the height or three W, of course, is the best. That was the rule I think Abhishek told just now. And so that can be done or three times the distance to the nearest ground plane, whichever one is applicable and whichever is more suitable. Even if you do it twice that, it would be pretty good. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. And just one final question. Um, uh, this is a question regarding decoupling capacitors. The question is, why do we need to put the lowest capacitance value near the power supply? Lowest capacitance value? Near the power supply, yes. Generally, see, let me put it this way. When you see the noise spectrum, it may comprise from low frequencies to high frequencies. It does. Now, any mostly in the power supply section, you have you know electrolytic capacitors, tantalum capacitors, large value capacitors. You know, they do not cover noise. They're you know, they have a resonant, and as you all know, a capacitor in reality is not just a pure capacitance. It has a series equivalent series resistance. It has an equivalent series inductance as well. So every real life capacitor has a resonant frequency given by one divided by square root of what you call the capacitance value multiplied by the, the equivalent series res inductance. Now that below that frequency, the device acts like a capacitor, but above that frequency, the capacitance behaves more like an inductor whose impedance keeps on rising. Now, the whole purpose of decoupling capacitors is to provide a low impedance path across the two points across which that capacitance is connected. So what have, so effectively what we are saying is that if you put a, the capacitance will work like a capacitor only below the resonant frequency and not above it. Above it is, it does not function as a capacitance. It does not filter that. It doesn't, capacitance across two lines basically is a low pass filter. So it does not filter the noise above the resonant frequency. So therefore, a low value capacitor like a ceramic capacitor, 0.1 microfarad, 0 0.01 microfarad, these capacitors have very high resonant frequencies. So they are able to act, they are able to filter out the high frequency noise across the power and the ground or across the two points you are connecting that capacitor. That's the key point, I hope. Uh, this kind of gives you a feeling as to why a low frequency capacitor, generally the low frequency ceramic capacitors are used to filter out the noise on the power distribution network at high frequencies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atar. Uh, so we have one last question to ask you, which is whether or not you, how you would rate the webinar. Thank you very much for answering. Thank you very much, Atar. Thank you. OK, and I know we have a few people left. So if you're interested, I guess maybe very quickly, I could show you uh, what Sierra has been working on. Uh, we've been working on a forum. We have a new community platform coming up. And I'm just going to, to show you that. We are going to launch next week. But in the meantime, you're going to get a sneak peek just for you guys. OK, so we're calling it Sierra Connect. If some of you were at PCB West yesterday and you saw everything about it, 
Uh, but basically, this is going to be a forum, a community platform when you can you can engage with peers. But uh, obviously, what we want to do is to provide you immediate help. So let's say you have a question about your design, about manufacturing, assembly, components, whatever it is. Uh, our engineering teams, our experts are going to be online and they're going to be able to reply to your questions. Uh, so see, for instance, what you can do is if you have a question about design, you can just create a topic. Okay, so you choose the test and here you can just do that. Tag Sierra and there you go. You have the Sierra's experts just here. And we can just get back to you, answer your questions right away. And so we really hope that this is going to be helpful to you guys. And here you're going to be able to see all of our upcoming events. So as you can see, we have a few seminars coming up. There's one with Susie Webb on October, in October. We have a soldering seminar with Jim Smith in November. And Dan Bicker is going to come to Sunnyvale, California. He's going to do his famous uh, Billion Dollar Mistake seminar in November. And then uh, it's in January only, but we have another webinar, a seminar with Kevin Coates. Uh, you guys know he's a very famous PCB West speaker. And here you're going to be able to access our KiCad quote plugging and watch our online courses. So this is something new as well. We are going to create courses. And I show you very quickly. There you go. So these are courses you can watch by yourself. Uh, you're going to see they're very cool. And we're going to have many, many more coming. And just one more thing for you. Let me show you our designer portal. Uh, we are still working on this. It's going to be available very, very soon. But basically, what we want to do is uh, we want to help you reduce your design time drastically. So we want to help you at any stage of the design process. Let it be at the very beginning for concepts or your schematic, your layout. We want to be there and give you the tools uh, you need to succeed on your own or have the opportunity to talk to us. You can book a meeting with our engineers and they're going to help you get through uh, your project. So see here, we're going to have these very cool tools when you can select your components, validate your BOM. And let me show you the PCB layout part because this one is very exciting. See, we're going to have many tools. Uh, you're going to be able to design your PCB stack up. Uh, to search your footprints, again, validate your BOM. You know, all of this is going to be available to you. And uh, this is a sneak peek, but we're very excited to see you guys, to show you guys what it's going to be. And this is really going to be awesome. So we'll share that with you very soon. Okay, thank you very much for everyone for attending. And hopefully we will see you soon during our next webinar. Thank you, Amit. Uh, thank you, the design team. Thank you, Atar. Thank you, everyone. Have a very good day.